Um, yeah, so like Peter said, I'm a, I'm a graduate student at Caltech. I work with um, Pietro Perona. And uh, I am maybe like, maybe a slight of an, an odd, a bit of an odd bird at um, in computer vision and that like, I really, I came into it because I loved vision, because I loved the creative problem solving, but also because I really had, um, I really had a goal. And that goal was to basically become an expert in these tools so that I could use them to help tackle what is a really serious problem uh, globally right now, um, which is trying to monitor and preserve biodiversity in the face of climate change and human encroachment. Um, I had gotten involved in some research in undergrad in uh, snow leopard re-identification. It kind of planted the seeds for me um, and I, I could really see the value and really see the need for uh, computer vision techniques for these real world problems. And generally um, we've had an amazing amount of success. You know, there's there's been uh, a lot of really awesome stuff that we've been able to do. But one thing that's become really clear with my research um, and is becoming sort of more and more um, understood across maybe the fields of machine learning and computer vision is that um, it's we make this IID assumption, right? We build these data sets and we split them perhaps random, randomly and we try to build models that we think will generalize and they might perform very, very well on those toy data sets. But what has consistently seemed to be an issue is, um, is getting models that work nearly as well as they do on something like ImageNet in the real world. And that um, that only sort of gets worse when you have a lot of these other types of challenges that come with the real world, such as data quality or um, just like uh, sort of the scale of, of data collection in different parts of the world and how you have imbalance in many different ways. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, basically like, how do you tackle these problems that don't necessarily turn up in curated data sets like ImageNet and Coco, but turn up pretty much across the board when you're trying to build things that work for real world problems in general, but specifically problems with passive monitoring sensors. So where you have um, sensors that don't move, that are collecting data almost all the time, and you want a machine learning model to work for those sensors, and you want it to work for a new sensor that you're going to place out um, in the same region or in a new region. Um, so just as a starting point, I put this link in the chat, um, but if you all can open this collab, um, so it needs to load in some data and run a bunch of stuff. And so if you open this up, click save a copy and drive and then run all, and you do that now, then when we get to the point where you're actually going to be messing with it, you don't need to like reload all the data and everything. Um, so hopefully that'll work well. Uh, so if you guys can all do that first, um, that would be fantastic. And maybe just let me know uh, if there are any issues with that. Running it um, will awesome. update if there's anything. Cool. It should take a minute, um, but uh, it's not loading a ton of images or anything. It's just a reasonably large metadata file. So, uh, yeah. Um, awesome. So why? Right? Why, why are we trying to work on biodiversity? Obviously, there are a ton of very important problems that people need to solve. Um, I think that for a long time, this was one that uh, the machine learning community didn't have a ton of interaction with. There have been a few people, um, mostly in, in more traditional AI, uh, things like um, game theory and um, even, you know, general like older statistical approaches that did interact with these conservation problems um, through uh, maybe the computational sustainability network. And they've all done really amazing work. Um, but just in the last maybe three, four, five years, there's been a growing interest in computer vision um, on, on biodiversity monitoring. And some of the main reasons are just uh, there's a need. And it's also something where we don't have the time to not address it. So we've seen a 68% average decline in species population sizes since just 1970. That means sort of just across the board. And those numbers, if you go to specific regions, say um, parts of Latin America, it's like 90, 92% of um, populations, but just animal populations generally have, have disappeared. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Climate change obviously plays a role uh, and so does just habitat destruction, um, burning forests for agriculture, um, things like this. 
And, uh, you know, this is obviously not really a new problem. Uh, bio biodiversity has been studied for hundreds of years. Um, but classically, the data itself was harder to collect and it was mostly manually collected. So that meant that, you know, um, a biologist or an ecologist would go out and they would potentially put a few static cameras and maybe as, as early as the 70s where those cameras would be using film and they would take some you know, set of photos over time. But really the data volume wasn't that large. But in, you know, as hardware and different types of data collection globally have become more accessible and cheaper, um, the amount of data that's being collected and the diversity of data that's being collected to monitor biodiversity is amazing. You have everything from whales being detected in satellite data, people using low-flying drones to do animal censuses. So here you can see, I, I like this example because um, the actual animal is just these like little white blobs, but then you have this like really amazing shadow that like really is giving you a lot of signal about um, the fact that it's an equine species and those are those are actually Grevy's zebra. Um, and then you have on animal sensors. These are things like um, RFID tags that you put on, um, let's say, sea turtles. Um, and then there's community science data. So I don't know if any of you have ever interacted with um, the app iNaturalist, um, which is iNaturalist is this amazing online community that helps identify species. And one of my colleagues, Grant Van Horn, worked with them in his PhD at Caltech. Um, to build a machine learning model that would try to identify species in real time. And now you can get the Seek app and you can just go point your phone at any plant or bug outside and it does it, its best at identifying the species. It works really well. And that's also a pretty amazing and pretty like epically scaled way to collect community, to collect biodiversity data through humans. And then this last set is these are examples of what we're going to be focusing on today. These stationary sensors. You can think of these like like a traffic camera, right? That's at a, at a stoplight, except for it's something where it's out in the wild. Some ecologist has gone and put a camera or maybe an audio sensor or sonar in some static place and it's collecting data over long periods of time. Um, and, you know, as that data is being collected at scale, what we see is that just the manual data processing, the traditional way that people approach this data is, um, is not able to keep up. So, for example, I have a network of camera traps that I placed in Laikipia, Kenya, and that network of camera traps has collected around 10 million images in the last year. Uh, obviously, I and even me and a team of, um, of people would not be able to go through and label that data. And this is where it actually gets a bit interesting because, you know, these days we label data at scale all the time using things like Mechanical Turk. But actually, when it comes down to identifying species, that's usually something that requires a bit of expertise. It's not, I mean, you can train people to do it, but it takes some serious training, for example, to learn to recognize in, in a camera trap image, whether something is a kudu, kudu or an eland, right? These, some of these species, um, these fine grained species categorization problems can be things that are not well addressed by the crowd. Um, same with these community science labels, 64 million species observations in a naturalist, last time I checked, that's a huge volume. Um, but what we run into is that there's maybe one spider expert for a given region, and that spider expert is the one who has to pretty much go in and, and label almost all of the data in that area and is able to handle those challenging cases. And, and that, again, now we're, we're not scaling, not in terms of just people who are interested, but in terms of the experts who can actually answer the labeling questions. Um, and aerial surveys probably generate the most data of anything, these are these censuses where people are counting, for example, um, elephant populations across the entire Great Amara ecosystem. And just one survey, that's just like a day or maybe a couple days can generate 200 terabytes of video. So obviously just labeling all of this data by hand is, is not going to work. And it's a really clear application for computer vision and machine learning, right? If we can do this well and do it at scale, um, we can make humans, the human experts, much more efficient, and hopefully we can help to, to really build our, our picture of the world around us. And the real goal is to mitigate some of the, the devastation that we're seeing across the taxonomic tree. Um, but biodiversity data is really noisy. Um, so unlike ImageNet, the things you care about might be heavily occluded, 
there might be significant weather or lighting issues. Um, and one of the most insidious parts is that a ton of the data is just empty, right? So uh, empty meaning uh, the subjects of interest to the biologist or the ecologist are not there. And um, yeah, these things are contributing to the fact that machine learning doesn't always necessarily work as well as we might like. Um, biodiversity data has a very long tail. So if we're looking at observations in iNaturalist, and this was the first 16 million observations in iNaturalist, I should probably update this figure. But generally, um, what we see is if, if you make the estimate that you need around 100 examples um, of a given species to be able to identify it well in an iNaturalist image, <clears throat> um, we have, you know, 10,000 species that have uh, enough data, right? But there's an entire order of magnitude more species that don't. So most of the data that we have across the taxonomic tree is massively concentrated in just a very small part of it. And low shot learning is a really well-known challenge for machine learning. Um, and then biodiversity data, as I mentioned before, just is not IID, <laughs> it's just not. So if you look um, here, this is a, a map of global biodiversity, a heat map of global biodiversity. So what you've got here is you've got, um, you know, you can really see that most of the biodiversity on earth is concentrated in the tropics. And if you look at um, on, on the right, you have all of the species occurrence data in GBIF, which is the um, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and it's based out of Denmark. Um, GBIF is a massive data aggregator. They take data from all of these papers across ecology, from these larger scale aggregates like iNaturalist, and they port all of these, what we call occurrence records, which is a GPS point and a species identification. And they port them all into one, one system you can really start to see that there is a massive bias towards data from the, you know, North America, Europe, and to some extent, Australia. And so not only do is the data very long tailed, um, the data is also kind of long tailed spatially. And it's long tailed spatially in a way that we actually don't have data for a lot of the places that have the most biodiversity. So, Let's just talk about static sensors. So if you think about just one type of static sensor, one that I'm very familiar with, I've done a lot of work with camera trap data in the last nine years. Um, so camera traps are these heat or motion activated static cameras that are you know, tied to trees like this ecologist is doing. And they're very widely used. They're, um, they're relatively inexpensive and they collect data at a resolution and sort of visually that can be used for a ton of different things. So everything from species distribution modeling to um, actually looking at the behavior of certain species or predator prey interactions. There are thousands of organizations that use these, tens of thousands of projects within those organizations, estimated around a million active camera traps globally. And, and that, that turns into hundreds of millions of camera trap images that are collected. Um, and so I work sort of part-time with, uh, with Wildlife Insights, which is um, a global scale data management platform for camera trap data. And it's partnered with Google. Um, so I, I work with them via you know, Google research. And these are, so this is actually older. It's saying 5 million. We now are at around 15 to 17 million records in Wildlife Insights. But you can see like we have these biases in our data. So, we luckily um, as with camera traps have a lot of data from these tropics, from these places where biodiversity is very massive, but obviously we're missing huge parts of the United States and Europe. And you know, almost no one has um, large scale biodiversity data in China or Russia. Um, and so if you're looking at these static there's, cameras. Um, what, there's a question yeah? by Arthur, he's asking how expensive are the cameras um, to get a sense for the scalability? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, they it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, uh, the, net, the network of cameras that I have in Africa, um, I was looking for the right trade off between like data quality and cost. And so we bought 100 cameras and each of them with a discount was around $120. Um, the cheapest camera traps out there are like 40 to 60 bucks. And if you want, you know, really nice research grade cameras, they can go into the thousands. Um, and there's a lot of people actually who are very interested in um, doing like edge based research, um, you know, machine learning on the edge with camera traps, um, trying to get like real time alerts for rare species, for example. 
And so a lot of people have been looking into building their own camera traps using um, like a Raspberry Pi and a motion trigger. Um, and, and that you can do pretty inexpensively if you have kind of the know-how. And there's a lot of people like there's this, um, this uh, uh, an organization called Field Kit that's run by a really amazing researcher called Shaw Selby out of Los Angeles. And um, they're kind of building these like modular static sensors where you can like put in like a camera and maybe a temperature sensor and, you know, build up these, uh, these field monitoring systems in a way that's really modular and, and cost efficient and open source. Um, did that answer your question? So super cool, thanks. Yeah, no problem. And if anyone's interested in edge-based processing, then there's a lot of interest. So I'd be happy to, to kind of point you in that direction um, after the fact. But yeah, so so going back to this, um, so, so looking at these two images, right? Um, this like arguably is probably the same deer, maybe. Uh, these images were taken a month apart. So one of the things that you get with a static sensor is you just, you don't get really a lot of bang for your buck, I guess is the right way to say it in terms of sample efficiency. So you can collect 10,000 images a month from one static camera, but it's not like you have 10,000 valuable training examples for a machine learning model because the variability is low across a single static camera. You know, the background is fixed. You might have some changes in lighting conditions, but it's really not gonna be that much necessarily over time. Um, and then animals themselves are very habitual. So they'll kind of come back to the same places, which means you kind of get the same pictures of the same animals <laughs> over and over again. Um, that means that you're really helping your models overfit, right? To some very specific things. And so if you kind of poke this a little further, what you see is that, um, you know, every single camera, you know, has this distinctive background, but they also have distinctive class distributions. So it's not even like you can say like, look, the distribution over the entire set of species is long tailed and it's long tailed like this, because actually what you get is you get a different class distribution per camera with this static background. So the machine learning models actually start to learn to memorize not only like this is what this you know static background looks like, but they also start to learn this sort of camera specific prior to some extent, because they start to learn like, look, a deer looks like this, but here, like there's, there's a mule deer. Um, well, that's a pretty specific type of thing in the context of this background. And so they might then learn kind of a really biased representation that isn't able to figure out what a mule deer looks like without the context of that background. And then, you know, like we said before, around 70% of the images from each camera are empty, right? So you have just this massive imbalance in terms of empty versus not. You can almost think of it like, um, like a whole image version of the, the classic detection problem where potentially you have a lot more examples of the background class in the foreground and people you know, do things like focal loss to try to handle that. Um, so it's not just camera traps that have these, these challenges. Are you um, these... off, Sarah? Oh. I, I... Hello, hello. Hi. Is Sorry. it me cutting off or is it you? Because I wasn't able to hear the last two, three sentences. It was rude, I think. Uh, <laughs> Sarah or Sarah? You, Peter. Ah, really? Oh, that's not good sometimes. So I'm sorry. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> ah. Um. Yeah, okay. Well, just going back, I guess I was just saying, yeah, a lot of the images are empty um, for camera traps. Um. And then the point being, uh, this is not these types of, you know, this low sample inefficient, this low sample efficiency and these, you know, site specific backgrounds and site specific distributions. This is not unique to camera traps. Um, so here is a set of passive bioacoustics, bioacoustic sensors that are placed um, around Cornell, um, near the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And these are being used to study bird calls. And so if we look at two of these sensors, you know, these are obviously, this is like, not like they're not like in different states like this is like in one small green area around you know the cornell lab um you can see that there's like a pretty significant difference um in terms of just like the background signal if you look at these sort of soundscapes as images 
Um, and going beyond that, uh, let's see, can you guys hear this? So you can hear the bird calls, but you also hear this like pretty specific background signal and that's pretty consistent across the two examples from this bioacoustic sensor. And now if we go to this one, oh. So in that one, you have, you know, this other different background. Um, but then it's not just that background signal that is significantly different across the network. It's, it's actually the types of birds that like to hang out, for example, near the water source versus in the deeper forest. That changes as well, right? So, so it's both this background signal mixed with these site-specific priors. And um, in another project that I'm working on, we work with uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game and NOAA and a bunch of other departments of fish and game across the West Coast. And we're looking at these static sonar cameras that are placed in rivers. So this is an example on the Kenai River. Um, and they're used to monitor salmonid escapement um, in order to maintain sustainable fisheries. So basically you put sonar in the river and currently what happens is humans sit in this tent at the tent site here and they watch a real time stream of data and they have an upstream clicker and a downstream clicker and they sit there and they try to pay attention and click for the number of salmon going upstream and the number of salmon going downstream. And then every four hours, they will radio in to the Department of Fish and Game in Alaska, the number of like just upstream salmon. So upstream minus downstream, which is like your, your amount that you can estimate have escaped upstream. And uh, those are the ones that you think will be able to then go spawn. And the reason to do this is because uh, in Alaska, there is a billion dollar fishing industry. And that fishing industry, um, in order for it to be sustained, in order for it to continue to exist year after year, they need to ensure that they get enough salmon going upstream that are able to spawn so that those spawned salmon, the eggs can hatch, go out to the sea, and in three years, they'll be coming back in, right? And so the, the fisheries actually try to basically in real time, every four hours, they make this decision of whether or not the fisheries in Bristol Bay or, or you know, in, in Nushigak or whatever are able to, um, to be open. And that means fishing can happen or whether they're shut down because they need more salmon going upstream. But this and, year is a lot of well annotated data, huge annotated data set. Yeah, huge annotated data set, except for what is the annotation, right? Because they're they're collecting that annotation on clickers. And so the, the way that they're recording it is um, we have records, uh, it, it's, it's a very, let's let's call it incredibly weakly annotated. So depending on the, the specific deployment, they either keep really sort of highly accurate records. So at NOAA, for example, they tend to record actually the second at which they have um, each salmon going upstream or downstream. In a lot of these cases, it's every four hours, they give an entire upstream count and it's their best estimate. In some cases, you know, when you have a million salmon going upstream in the middle of the season, uh, they're basically the humans are like doing rough estimates of groups of 20. Um, and then they're only looking at maybe 15 minutes of data out of every hour um, because they have multiple cameras. And so they're having to go back and forth between the cameras. And so as a result, it's a, it's a pretty rough estimate currently. I mean, it's better than nothing, but the, the annotation is, you know, four hours of video, a single number. And um, this is, this is sonar. So it's like a radar, but under underwater, right? So you get like dots and a map basically. Yeah. So this here, um, this is showing, uh, the sonar for two of these cameras. Um, there's a couple of very things going on here. So um, one thing is the beam width, which is like the number of sort of sonar beams that are being um, pinging at any given point. And the other thing has to do with the lens and, and how, how far they're trying to look into the river. Um, and that also then affects the fish size. Um, as you can see here, like these are fish here, here, and here. There's a group here. Here's the group down here. Wow. Um, you get pretty good at recognizing these, but it, there is a lot of this reflectance off the background. And you can see here, right? Like this is probably some bathymetry of the river bottom causing this here. And, and you don't see a similar thing on the other side. Um, yeah, but it, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fun problem. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, and actually, in this case, I think, um, you know, in some of these static monitoring cases like this one and also with the sonar, um, a huge amount of the signal is temporal, right? And there are a lot of people who work on video, but I, I still think that like really robustly handling temporal signals is something that there's a lot of room to improve. Um, and in cases like this, or I actually have another recent project where we're trying to count ants at an ant's nest um, using a static camera. And in that one also like the majority of the signal is actually temporal, right? Um, humans do much better when they can see the thing moving. And without that movement signal, it can be pretty hard to tell if something is like a fish or just maybe a, a piece of weed or a log or something. Um, yeah, and so like I've said, but like, let's do this a little more explicitly. State-of-the-art models do not generalize to new camera locations, unfortunately. Um, so what we've got here is, is an early study I did where we were looking at camera trap data and we um, had, we trained on a set of camera locations and then we held out some data from those same camera locations um, from different days. And that data we called our CIS evaluation set. And so these are, you know, borrowing from chemistry, you know, CIS is same and trans is sort of across or let's call it different. Um, so the CIS training data were same locations of cameras, like same static sensors, but just held out different days of data. And then the trans is looking at performance on this set of completely held out sensors, you know, camera traps that were never seen during training. And what you see here is, you know, kind of what you'd expect. Um, you have this, you know, inverse relationship between error and the number of training examples for a given species. Um, so we'd expect, you know, this to be a lot worse if you have, you know, one training example your performance usually is pretty bad. And then, you know, up to, you know, 10,000. Um, but the, the thing that was really, I think the important point here is this gap, right? So how do, we, how do we close this gap? How do we truly sort of generalize well and get models that can learn to recognize given species that, you know, a human can do this really well, right? You teach someone what a bobcat looks like and they're able to figure out that if this is a bobcat, that that's also a bobcat, right? but that's still really hard for, for state-of-the-art machine learning models. And um, you know, th this type of thing is, is something that a lot of people um, are facing across a bunch of different applications. And recently we put out a, a new paper, myself and, and many other amazing, amazing researchers put out this paper that was looking at this type of distributional robustness um, across a ton of real world applications. And um, you know, this is something that that you run into when generalizing, say, for self-driving cars, going to new cities, et cetera. Um, they're pretty wide scale problems or generalizing to new types of patients in, in medical imaging. So what does work? Um, well, nothing has been able to completely close the gap yet, but some stuff helps a lot. So in this case, this is, you know, using the temporal signal in really naive ways, but using just classic change detection methods, things like optical flow, common filters, um, we're able to do better um, and then, you know, <laughs> generating iterative weak supervision and, and trying to sort of train on your test data, but with not any sort of real labels that that can also help. But then, of course, you can also be building in biases. Um, and then, you know, in this case, just like <laughs> for camera traps, just reduce the impact of that static background by using localization. So either train a species specific detector or actually in this case, what we did is we just trained a human animal vehicle detector and we trained it on a lot of camera traps from all around the world. And though the species classification is still pretty hard, what we found is that just finding the animals generalized really well. And so this is, this model's open source and it's probably, I mean, it's not impactful in terms of computer vision research. It's, it's just a detection model. Um, you know, the probably the impact is that in the data that we uh, that we labeled and the diversity of the data that we used to train it on. Um, and then the fact that we just made it accessible to ecologists and it's being used by probably 30 organizations worldwide um, just for a bunch of different stuff. And, you know, everything from allowing humans to really just look at, you know, 15 percent of the data instead of all of it in cases where they have, you know, millions and millions of camera trap images collected every year, like Idaho Department of Fish and Game, we're collecting around 5 million images a year and the number's going up. And now that now that they're using this model, they, they really can actually focus on a much smaller set of that data, the stuff that the machine learning model is not confident on or, or actually doing that species ID. Um, and then in, in another example, we work um, 
with a nonprofit called Wildlife Protection Solutions. And they've actually set up, like we were talking about this edge-based system where they're not doing the processing on the edge, but they have figured out how to send data. And so they'll send data to the cloud when it's collected. Um, they run it through our model and then they send real-time alerts to protected area managers when humans or vehicles are seen that uh, in places where they shouldn't be um, to help mitigate poaching risks. And they estimate that they, you know, using this model are finding about on average, like one real animal threat per week um, across like the 18 countries they operate in. Um, another thing that can help is, you know, like we were talking about, there's this sort of distribution shift around the world in terms of where species might be. Um, and one thing that's been shown in the case of iNaturalist is that you can estimate a species prior, right? Like say like, okay, given a place and a time and an image, can you estimate a prior that will help you redistribute um, your, uh, yeah, just take a Bayesian step, right? Like take the outputs of your classifier, multiply it by some species prior, and then um, and then use that ranking to give you your top one. And they found that this works well in iNaturalist and gives them maybe a 10% boost. Um, but iNaturalist is humans going out and taking the photos. So you have a lot less of the issues in terms of the static camera and that like static background that we were talking about. So how do you do like maybe online prior estimation at a per sensor level? Um, how do you learn basically the animal habits at a given sensor? Um, and then so implicitly uh, in some recent work, we, we came up with a way to do this using attention. Um, one of the things that I was saying, you know, like in that example where you have the deer and it's the same deer over a month, um, we wanted to be able to give the model what humans were using already. This, this temporal information, not just over a minute, but over really long time scales. So for example, in this example above, what you're seeing here is um, each of these images is an image that, um, that was coming from the same camera trap over the entire month of July, 2012. And um, this is the one that we're trying to identify. And what we've done is we've built, we've done this two pass system where in the first pass you extract representative features across the set of data seen in a month. And the second pass, you use attention over, like you take in the image and then you use attention over that feature set. And that attention model is then giving you this temporal context in a way. Um, and spatial context, because we also let it know sort of where in the image the, uh, the object was seen. And what you see here and these green numbers, this is like the attention weight for a given image, right? And so in this case, you can see that it's pulled out again, this warthog that's going back and forth over a very long time, um, you know, like spread out across the whole month, and is using that information to help itself identify the warthog that's seen here. Um, and sort of similarly, in a nice adaptive way, showing that uh, because you use attention instead of some, you know, handcrafted heuristic, um, in this case where there's a Thompson's gazelle that's just hanging out in front of the camera and, you know, is seen like, you know, tons of times within just an hour in the same day, um, the attention model sort of pays the most attention to those images, which are, you know, probably more visually similar. And again, it helps, um, you know, high level, and you, know, you obviously can read the paper, but for the sake of this talk, just pretty high level, the way that we're doing that is we are um, putting this attention block in this into this memory bank that's extracted in the first pass, um, post RPN and pre object classification uh, within a faster RCNN model. And we find that this helps quite a lot. Um, but <laughs> here is where it's interesting. So remember how I said before, you have, um, we had this network of camera traps and we split it up where we took some camera traps and we had those be our training set. And then we had some, you know, that we were evaluating that were the same camera traps and some that were different. So that was within just, you know, one small part of the world that was just in the south, the southwest of California. So the sort of tutorial part of this is going to be um, less vision explicitly and more data science. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into that collab and have all of you um, try to decide how to split the data from a set of camera traps to be able to uh, evaluate in a robust way how well your model works. Um, and so if you all go to the collab, hopefully it's run. Let me know if anyone had any issues with that. Um, what we're gonna do is uh, kind of, we'll you can kind of read through and work through on your own. I'll kind of like go through as well. Um, and, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I just saw the chat. 
I just, since I closed my window, but yeah. So the idea is uh, you're all going to try to come up with your best way to figure out how to split the data. And um, there's a bunch of caveats, which are like, remember that you probably want to be able to evaluate as many species as possible. And you don't want to get nearly perfect accuracy because you've let massively let your model overfit to a set of cameras. Um, yeah. So I don't think there actually is a right answer. Um, this is all data from the iWildCam competition last year, uh, which is a sort of yearly camera trap competition I run as part of a, the fine grain visual categorization workshop at CVPR. And um, I just had to do this. I, I just had to make my best guess at like, you know, what's a robust way to split this data for evaluation. And I think it's pretty fun to kind of make people face and think about, you know, not like being handed a curated data set, but how do you actually make these decisions so that you can, you know, try to guarantee to your best effort <laughs> whether this thing will work for the end user. All right. Uh, yeah, Joseph, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I didn't want to just uh, butt but in. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, so I'm uh, calling in from the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I was really thrilled to, to attend this talk because uh, I've been reading some of your work uh, Sarah, while I've been preparing for my final year undergraduate project. Um, so in particular, recognition in Terra Incognita was a really <laughs> useful resource. Um, I've been trying to build an edge-based re replacement for a camera trap um, that uses so on-device inference instead of uh, a passive infrared sensor. Um, I got an interesting result. I don't know whether it's because I made a mistake at some point, but I found that uh, I was using an SSD single shot detector model uh, and it generalized very well. In fact, it performed better on trans locations than it did on cis locations. And I was interested if you knew why that could be the case. I noticed in recognition you were looking at, you weren't looking at single shot detectors. So I didn't know whether do you know why I could have done that? Is it a mistake or could it possibly have done a really good job generalizing? I doubt that it's a mistake, um, but it might be it might be related to something in your data. So um, so I actually recently, I think with with the mega detector, we've been you know doing different experiments with wildlife insights, you know, different architectures. What I found that is that um, kind of as you scale up and as your evaluation set is sort of as diverse as possible. Um, all of these architectures are doing pretty much the same. Like there's basically nothing that I've come across that's just massively solving this problem more than anything else. Um, but that is not necessarily the case at, at smaller resolutions spatially and taxonomically. So um, for example, uh, if you're really, if you're a uh, project is really interested in rodents, you probably want a detector that takes in reasonably high input resolutions because you want to be able to detect small things. Um, and some parts of the world, most things are quite small. And in some parts of the world, you have stuff that's super iconic, like giraffes and elephants, that is honestly pretty easy to detect with a COCO model. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, d I wouldn't say it's a mistake. Uh, what I would say is I would avoid making strong claims about it being universally true, but it might absolutely be true for your data of interest. <laughs> if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, it does. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, my model is targeted specifically at birds rather than anything else. So it is possible that maybe it's, uh, uh, yeah, the, the choice of data has, has so, yeah, come yeah. into play. And, and, yeah, the choice of, you know, taxonomic interest. And then also, um, you know, recently, like I've, I think the models that I seem to, like I've been gravitating towards recently have been things like RetinaNet, which is, you know, based off an SSD, but with focal loss um, or efficient debt stuff that um, mostly I, I, I just like RetinaNet because it seems to be pretty robust to hyperparameters. So I, <laughs> as I like go on in my PhD, it's like, I don't know. I if if it's the difference between like maybe one percent on a test set that you're gonna do your best to make sure that test set's representative, but in these static sensor scenarios, no test set is representative. That's kind of what I'm coming around to. Um, 
And maybe the very best thing that you can do is just make sure you have really robust quality control for any new project that you're going to bring in. Um, just in terms of like making sure that you're not building a model and telling someone that it's going to work with X amount of accuracy on their project and then they use it off the shelf and don't look into it and it has some systematic bias against you know some species of bird, for example. And then they build a species distribution model on that and they use that to adjust science policy and, and in the end you've basically like potentially really done some harmful thing uh, using, you know, just due to your machine learning models bias against rare species, for example. Um, so I'm really pushing for really good quality control. And if you are doing a project on this with edge based models, I think that that actually um, plays an even bigger role, because ideally, I think a lot of the times with edge based models, the goal is maybe to not have to collect or not have to send as much data. But if you do have a systematic bias in your model, you really want to capture that because what it means is if you don't keep all the data, and even if you do, but you don't review it very frequently, potentially you're like missing something all the time, and then you just don't know. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of ways to slowly make things better, but I think it's just a really hard problem, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I came to the conclusion that probably uh, it's not. It wouldn't replace a camera trap, but uh, maybe in the future that it can run alongside them for some studies. Have you seen um, the Conservation X Labs, the Sentinel project that they're doing? Um, there's a bunch of people who are interested in edge-based camera traps. There's also like the Trail Guard cameras, um, but this one they're kind of in the. I just put, sent a link in the chat, but um, I think they're trying to do like a sort of a plug and play thing where it would um, be something that you could attach to your already existing and already purchased camera traps that would do the edge processing, which is kind of a cool way to think about it. And yeah, FieldKit is not using CV. They're really like, look, we know that's really hard, but um, they're kind of hoping to actually make the sensors themselves more scalable. And then like probably one day they'll, uh, they'll put maybe a, you know, more processing power on there. Cool. Is it possible um, to ask another question or at the end, uh, Peter, which one is the... Uh... No, no. First of all, Sarah is the decider here, but I think okay. it's okay to ask now. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. Okay, so I have a short question. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Tome. I'm from Israel. Um, and they, I work in a dental company. I use, I basically a computer vision engineer, but I also outside work, I volunteer with my great colleagues at uh, an NPO and called the deep voice and we do uh um, basically whale research in mozambique okay we have um, um hydrophones that uh, we record annually since 2018 and we also did another uh, expedition in 2019 last year was COVID, so maybe this year will go out maybe <laughs> <laughs> so my question was uh, about your experience basically we collect the data annually Okay, so we come to the breeding grounds every year at around the same dates, like July, August, something like that. And we spend there, uh, spend the time at the BCSS uh, at the place and, um, and we do our recordings and we um, bring them and analyze them here um, in Israel specifically and uh, create for marine biologist tools. So I would like to know from your, your experience, two things, because this is kind of different from like, um, uh, the way you depicted and uh, collecting the data from different cameras uh, a long time. We do it annually. So it's like seasonal data, you could call it or something like that. So from your, your experience, what are the caveat, caveats of these, um, this type of uh, data collection? And this for one. And the second one, maybe something about bioacoustic collection and machine learning regarding wildlife. Uh, noises, cleaning the data, something from your experience, because I can talk a lot about the hard thing we've been through, but maybe from you, we can learn more. I mean, so I, one thing I'd say first is that I've, I've tinkered with bioacoustic bio data, but there are a bunch of really amazing experts on bioacoustics, people like Grant Van Horn at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology or Emmanuel de Fouque, um in South Africa, who or you know, a ton of the people at, at the Lab of O have really amazing research. Um, and also even specifically with whales uh, and hydrophones with whales. And there's also a team at Google AI that, that works on bioacoustics with whales. Um, I would say, uh, so in terms of the way that you're collecting data, I think when it comes to biodiversity and probably just generally with real world models, um, 
collecting and analyzing the data, the biggest thing is you need to think about, okay, what is your use case and how do I try to evaluate, uh, evaluate that as accurately as possible given the data I have. So if you're going out and collecting data year to year, and now you have data from year one and data from year two, probably uh, one very, very obvious sanity check is see if a model that you train on the year one data generalizes to the year two data. Um, and you know now train a joint model in year one and two and, and have an evaluation set that you, that you label really exhaustively for year three and, and investigate that as well. And start to see if you, if you do start to get some sort of saturation and it does learn well, or if there's differences. Um, other big things are just like, be really careful about sensor types. So if you change your sensor, it's, it's just like that classic science thing. Don't change too many variables at once, right? <laughs> if you change a bunch of variables at once, it's really hard to understand why something starts to fail. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, more generally with bioacoustics, um, I don't know, you should take a look actually. So recently they put out, um, which is really amazing, uh, on the Merlin app in the US and Canada, they have a uh, Merlin sound ID as of like the last couple of weeks. So you can just take your phone outside and hold it up and it will tell you what species of birds are calling in the background and you know dealing with overlaps and all sorts of stuff. And Grant's been writing up a series of blog posts about how they built that and the things that they learned. Um, and I think the recent, one of the most recent ones was actually explicitly about um, data cleaning and like best practices for handling bioacoustic data. And I thought it was really well written. So that would be a good place to start. Um, and then the other thing, I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, I run a Slack channel on AI for conservation that's got like a couple more than 500 researchers on it, like all over the world. And there's a bunch of really great bioacoustics people on there. And so if you do have any other specific questions, like you should join the Slack channel. We'd love to have you and, and you know anyone else who's interested in these types of topics. It's been a really amazing resource just in terms of like, yeah, dealing with these like best practices questions without having to reinvent the wheel all the time. I will add the comment here, all these references, they will be posted on the recording and anybody else who's gonna watch this later will see it, including Sarah, I already wrote down the bioacoustic research and projects, the people, uh, those that do the whales research, Google AI, all the references where to find, will all be posted, everybody. Worry awesome. not. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, so let's all, let's all take a minute and uh, yeah, try to try to work through this collab. And remember, there's not really a right answer here. Um, but what I'd like to do is just have you know have all of you, you're all super intelligent, work through it. Think about ways that you might rethink and ways that you might try to capture some of these different sort of challenges with data like this um, to evaluate it well. And then let's uh, we'll just have an open discussion at the end about um, some of the things you guys thought about and. Uh, and kind of what what you would what you would decide on if it was your choice, basically. So maybe we'll come back in. I think we have another thirty minutes, Peter. Right? Yeah. So we'll let's come say back 25. in like. Cool. So let's come back maybe in ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Awesome. I'm already running the code and playing with it, so. Awesome. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> I will ask again, uh, people I said I'll mention it. Um, whoever can, please turn on your video. We have a good participation today. It's nice, let's have even more if we can. So if you can take this moment, turn your video on so we can see you. Hello. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions or comments as they're, as they're running through it, uh, totally feel free. Hi, so one question, I cannot find the column. Where, where do I find the Google column? Uh, if you scroll up in the chat, um, uh, Peter linked it again. I think it's the last link right now appearing in the chat as well. Perfect. And yeah, just, I mean, I think they should be view only links, but just, just as a caveat, please click that save a copy and drive because I have had this issue before in a tutorial where people start overwriting each other's work, mm -hmm. which sucks. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's frustrating.
yeah. We actually had people on YouTube also ask for the link, so it's sent there as well. Perfect. If anybody needs something, let us know. Hey, sir, I had a general. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a couple of general questions if, if we have time here. Sure. Oh, uh, yeah. So, hey, uh, my name is Dan from Kit, where uh, I think we've been exchanging some messages recently, Sarah. Nice, nice to meet you. Great talk so far. Thank you so much. It's really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, um, one thing that, that struck me when I was looking at the examples you were showing of the, the camera traps, uh, it, it seems like, and I think you mentioned this at some point directly, uh, if you have these things running out there in the wild, you know, for and days or weeks or months. Uh, a lot of the data you collect is going to be pretty much identical uh, with respect to the actual samples of animals that you find, right? Like if you have like one gazelle or like warthog or something that's like running back and forth in front of the camera over and over, you know, over a couple of days, like those don't really constitute like unique samples from like a training perspective most of the time, right? Especially since it's like the exact same angle, pretty much the same background and same animal, like. Yeah. Either going so down, for, going that way. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, um, in that recognition in Terra Incognito paper, we we subsampled our training data by a half and then by a quarter, and I think we even went further than that. And uh, you basically get the same generalization performance. So, yeah. like, this uh, is a way to kind of probe the the actual sample efficiency. And one thing we've been looking at lately is some of these like information theoretical approaches to um, to actually understanding like what the value of a given sample is um, for training. And it's like, I think it's a really interesting way to think about static data, like how how much are you really getting out of this extra, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or million images that are pretty similar. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I have not read that paper, sorry. But no. uh, one, one question I had is, have y'all looked into, um, I don't, I don't know what this area is called. We've been struggling with it recently because we do a lot of data collection ourselves and uh, data set curation, which is a very hard problem for this and other reasons. Um, but we've been looking recently into this area of like data set pruning, essentially. Uh, There's a really good paper written back in 18 by, uh, or 19 by Sammy Bengio et al. And uh, a couple other papers since then where people try to look at you know, things like ImageNet or SciFar or something. And they actually find that you can you can throw away 10, 20 more percent of your data uh, because they're they're essentially semantically redundant. Um, mm -hmm. And they add like no value to classification or other tasks. And uh, we've been sort of looking at this recently on a couple different projects where we're curating data sets because uh, we have a similar problem. Uh, we do a lot of video. Uh, so we have a lot of data sets where we have like a camera up on a drone, for example, and we collect data of whatever. And uh, because it's video, uh, yeah, it might be data installation, thank you, Tom. There, there might be a couple different words for it. But um, because it's video, especially like 30 hertz video, uh, most samples are, are pretty redundant. You know, it's the same person yeah. or animal or car, thing, the same perspective and the same background at 30 hertz, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, we've been trying to figure out you know how you how you collect a base bucket of data that uh, has these better um, better conditions in terms of like what assumptions you make in terms of like ID between the samples um, using some of these methods. So it's, it's just interesting. I was wondering if you had any experience here with like more than more than naive, I guess, ways of like cutting a data set or distilling it set, as uh, Tomer says here. Yeah, I think maybe the first high level question is like why. Right. So, I mean, yeah, ideally, uh, you want all the the images, for example, in your data set to be highly sample efficient. So one really maybe obvious uh, answer to why is computational cost. Um, if you're training on a data set that's 12 million images, um, you need some pretty serious GPUs or you need to spend a bunch of time. Um, if you can train a model that gets the same results with 100,000 images, um, that's like massive, massively reducing your computational cost. Um, but I guess, yeah, I, I, if I were you, I would, I would be like, look, is what what's the reason I want to downsample my data? Is it for, 
Is it for computational costs? Is it for accessibility to people who maybe don't have access to large computational engines? Is it just for iteratability? Um, yep. What I tend to do is I'll like, I mean, I'll, I'll do kind of what I'm doing, what I'm having you all do now in the collab, which is like try to make some smart choices based on metadata and, you know, similar things about uh, uh, what might be useful data. So if I'm, you know, building uh, like a quick iterative training data set, for example, on using a bunch of data from Lila.science, which is like a open source um, data repository for biodiversity data. And um, they have a lot of different camera trap data sets on there. I'll pull like, a few examples per species, per camera, per project, right, um, of a given thing. Like try to get as much kind of diversity in, in that type of way um, as possible. Um, what I, I have looked into, and we had a deep learning or um, an active learning paper uh, in Methods of Ecology and Evolution earlier this year that was kind of doing a similar thing where you take like the crops from mega detector and then you embed those into some space and then you try to basically like, you know, really adapt to a new set of species in a new area by just labeling the clusters as opposed to labeling um, into all the individual images. It works pretty well. Um, yep. But I think you take a similar embedding approach, right, to try to, and this is what I was talking about in terms of the information bottleneck stuff, and that specifically is a recent paper by Alessandro Achille. Um, I can, I'll try and find it. Uh, but um, where they're looking at uh, specifically trying to find these examples that are um, hurting your performance. So it's not just like the diversity, but actually trying to understand like which example is the most detrimental. So in our case, uh, we get these images where the animal will be super close to the camera and it's kind of just like weird blurry texture and it'll still get labeled an example for that species, but actually those are, those are highly confusing to the model. Um, or if it's just like the tuft of an ear or something. Highly confusing, probably not very useful in terms of sample efficiency and actually maybe doing more harm than good. Um, so, you know, how do you actually prune a data set to get the most representative and like useful examples as opposed to just um, the minimal set of diverse examples, I think is interesting. Yeah, no, that is. And uh, you mentioned earlier the why behind this. Um, sample efficiency is one for sure. Uh, the other maybe more nuanced one that people run into all the time we see it all the time in our customers anyway, um, is that people will curate these data sets and they'll just do like a naive like 80 split on their, like, if they're big bucket of train data with no respect to um, whether or not you're basically testing on an identical sample that you're training on, right? Yeah. Because if you just have a big bucket of like millions of images and uh, you know, you think that you know, your experimental setup should guarantee you know, roughly ID samples, but it doesn't actually. And you know, every two weeks, the same warthog walks left in the image gets captured yeah. in the camera. Uh, you do this, you see a straight up split, you're gonna have a bunch of pollution between your train and then at that point, you know, what, is, what does the progress you're making model wise actually mean? Yeah, so I actually think that um, there's potentially just, it's just a fallacy to assume that you can create a representative IID data set in the real world. I think yeah. that it's just, I just, this is an assumption that is going to be broken. And so uh, I think maybe the bigger question is like, not how do you force your data set to be IID, in which case in almost all case, in almost all cases I've dealt with, you're going to get massively falsely high results. Um, and then you start to break trust with your end users because you claim that something is 97% accurate and then you give it to them and it sucks. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's more important to actually try to build a test set that's representative of their use case. Um, and try to be like as honest as possible in terms of how you're evaluating your models. Very cool. Yeah, good thoughts. Thank you. That's all I had. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know. Has anyone has anyone had any luck with uh, with with trying anything on the collab? Um, does anyone have it, or any even just looking at the distributions of you know what's going on here in terms of the sequences and the classes and everything? Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, sorry, I was just. Oh, well, you can go, go first. Ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, I, I looked at a little bit of the code. Uh, just the, the way, basically you're, you're doing, looks like you're trying to do some sort of stratified sampling um, that is taken into account. Uh, we have you know these distributions and let's try to sample uniformly across all possible ways that we could look at this distribution. I mean, obviously you're not looking at all possible ways that you can uh, look at the distribution and it's, prob and it's not possible to actually sample uniformly 
uh, across all distributions because you might have, you know, um, uh, there could be conflicting um, interests, uh, conflict, conflicting um, sampling uniformly on one axis could be conflicting with sampling uniformly on some other axis. For instance, number of images per camera trap versus the number, the particular species that you're uh, taking into account. So I think what you have here is a, a really good sort of trade-off between um, uh, b between these these different uh, competing uh, competing things that you need to really think about or optimize when you're when you're building the split. And certainly, uh, splitting across locations is the number one thing to do. But then going deeper into um, how the uh, the annotations are select? distributed across those. Yeah, it's like it's it's so you're like okay, we definitely need to split by location. But then okay, which which locations do you pick is a hard question. So yeah, I've, I guess I've, I've context, come across this problem before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really hard. And so for context, like pretend that you're me trying to decide on the data split for uh, like this iWildCam competition. Like you're just gonna have to pick something, but you want to pick something that's hopefully as representative as possible. Anyway, so, yeah. so that's yeah, actually so... kind of it's like, I know there's no right answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can prove there's no right answer. Um, <laughs> The uh, generally what I do is I I'll, I'll like make a a list of um, uh, I'll, I'll look at the category distribution of, of each split or like um, I'll make multiple distributions of properties that I care about and I will randomly split across locations until I see one that looks kind of nice and then I'll just pick that one. Um, the other comment that I wanted to make was uh, if you're not familiar with the Seaborn library, that can make writing a lot of these plots a lot more concise. Uh, and, and if you combine it with pandas, like if you put a lot of your uh, statistics that you compute in a pandas data frame, using Seaborn to plot them um, is uh, would be you use less code to uh, actually produce the yeah. plot. No, I, I put this in here mostly because uh, it was more like look. Here's, you know, here's a bunch of code that you can use to do this. But yeah, absolutely, there's more efficient ways to visualize your data. Um, I, I also kind of wanted to be very explicit about like, you know, this is the metadata that's provided usually. Um, so like, you know, interacting with it in certain ways. But yeah, absolutely, that code could probably be way more efficient than my apologies. Yeah, I, just want, I just wanted to give it a shout <laughs> out to Steve Morgan <laughs> Pandas as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very it's very readable. Uh, and yeah, I, I have I have actually used Seaborn before. I think really what it comes down to is I just copy paste a lot of code all the time. I'm sure all of you guys do that. I'm like, oh, I already did this. Copy paste. <laughs> uh, I've got a question about the sort of practicality around. It. Sorry, Anka from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I work with Symbite. We help people build AI. Um, so the cameras they've got obviously you've got a lot of pictures that get taken every day, every hour, every minute. How, how does that get into the cloud? Are, those, are they like conservationists that actually run around and you know download it to something? Because I imagine these things aren't close to any sort of signal, right? Yeah, it depends on where you are in the world and what type of signal and um, also just the cost. Um, so you know, there are ways, there are companies that will hook up your camera with uh, with you know data to send things automatically to the cloud, um, but that can the costs can really add up when you're talking about collecting ten thousand you know high resolution images per sensor per project. Yeah. Um, so to be super honest, and it's a very depressing answer. Um, we looked at literally all of our options to get the data back from Kenya, and the uh, the number one thing that we do is we either take it ourselves like mules. So I just came back with 18 terabytes of data from Kenya on a bunch of big hard drives, um, or we ship it. We ship hard drives and I upload them here in the US um, okay. because yeah, even the very best connection that you have, even if we go through the University of Nairobi and we set all these things up to upload from Kenya was gonna take you know months versus I can get totally. shipped to me in a couple weeks. So, so um, we yeah. Yeah, edge-based stuff is, is necessary because of these Certainly. problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we developed some software in Kenya that's similar, similar problems, it's more audio problems, but we've had to go the same route essentially. So in some areas, if you're lucky, you can do exactly that, but yeah. 
uh, we, we actually use um, USSD for some of the data transmission, which is very weird, but it kind of works. Um, That's cool. Uh, yeah, and the, the second question I wanted to ask is, oh, there's actually two more questions, but this one first, do you ever add like time series features to these? Because obviously animals are very habitual, right? As you said. Yeah, yeah. So that um, that last paper that I super briefly talked about, um, the context RCNN paper, that was using um, using attention to incorporate uh, information over time. Um, I've also, you know, in that paper, we, we compared to baselines that are sort of video based, but I think where specific with the camera traps where it gets interesting is that this you don't have consistent temporal sampling and at best your frame rates like one frame per second. So okay. a lot of the classical video approaches that rely on like optical like continuity, for example, across time um, yeah. tend to break down. Uh, yeah. And attention handles that really well, right? It handles the fact that, you know, potentially you have, you know, a bunch of images taken back to back at one frame per second, and then you'll have a gap of six hours. Hmm. Um, yeah. But even just like, uh, like warthogs go out when the sun sits or the sun rises. So something as yeah, yeah. Can... Um, okay. I, So, yes, I mean, in that, in that attention based approach, the, the sort of embedding over time was, um, you know, some compressed version of visual embedding plus time in, embedded in sort of a, a similar way to how people handle embeddings and transformers generally with time and place. Um, and then, and then also we have the, the location in the image of the box. Very cool. So trying okay. to explicitly capture some of that information as, as opposed to explicitly. Um, I what see, I do yeah. find is overfitting in terms of time of day is a huge issue. So I, uh, like the best possible models you can train on this, the Caltech camera traps data set, which is a data set I released earlier. Um, they get really good at recognizing raccoons at night and they really struggle to rec recognize raccoons during the day because there are just way fewer examples of raccoons during the day. Um, okay. You should be able to learn that, but there is, you know, it's IR sensors at night, not IR during the day. I've done some, you know, GANs to try to generate more daytime versus nighttime data. And I've, you know, we've used synthetic data and a bunch of different ways to try to address these challenges. And I wouldn't say that anything is like magic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <got it. laughs> And then one last question, if, if I can, um, is do, would it be useful to put up more than one camera at a specific location so that you can almost filter out what is moving and what is not moving? Yeah, so um, by that, do you mean like just, so do you mean actually like a stereo camera? So you'd have like yeah. spatial structure on the scene. Exactly. Yeah, um, you could even, so I looked a little bit and I should spend more time on it, but I've been busy at uh, like structure from motion, even just with a single camera, because like the camera does slightly shift in the wind and stuff over time. And so theoretically you could build like the 3D structure of the scene um, in some you know robust way to understand what's different. Um, but yeah, if you have stereo, so there was some early work uh, that, uh, that I saw that had like stereo cameras for um, like stereo camera traps essentially. And they were trying to do uh, detection and maybe even mm. segmentation from that. And sure. yeah, I mean, yeah, it totally helps. It's just that you just don't have it in most of the cases, right? Of course, but I'm, I'm trying to think like what is the most practical next step for improvement? So one mm -hmm. would either be you'd have edge computing as the, the direction that people are trying to go in, which is kind of, kind of difficult and complicated and also it kind of requires you to have a connection to something whereas if you have stereo cameras that's like one more cheap static camera you can maybe even set it up further back and thereby you get some depth and stereo you know i don't know I'm just guessing yeah it, but i think that's pretty so, useful interestingly enough um i think it would help I, our detection models are doing really well so detection is not the challenge okay. um classification is the challenge. And classification is the challenge because of the sample efficiency problem. So say say you have a rare species, like we're talking about that long tail distribution, you have to handle low shot learning. And then it's like worse than every other low shot learning scenario because you're like, oh, we have a thousand images, but it turns out they're from two cameras. So like, do you really have like 10? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so the challenge is not detection necessarily. Um, uh, you know, obviously there's caveats here, really detecting really small animals, detecting animals that move really quickly. There are obviously, there's still room to improve, but I'd say the biggest challenge is accurate, robust species classification and camera trap data. 
And I think the, the big things to tackle there are, you know, handling the sample inefficiency and dealing with the, the long tail. Okay. Um, we've had some really great results with some pretty dumb stuff like uh, copy paste augmentation. So if you use uh, the mega detector to get detection boxes in a weekly supervised way, and then you use this deep Mac model that came some, from some colleagues at Google to do um, like, you know, weekly supervised segmentation from within a box in a class agnostic way. Then you get these like rough segmentation labels and then you use those and you just splat them all over a bunch of the empty data um, and use that as kind of like this, you know, like we're trying to learn a disambiguation between background and foreground. You're trying to reduce this memorization of like that context. And so if you can go to something like segmentation, I mean, you're still gonna have some of those biases. Like the animals are always walking on a trail. So you're getting like very similar poses, for example, but flip them around, rotate them, do a bunch of weird stuff like copy paste data augmentation is a really nice first step. Not yeah. very smart, um, but like I'm happy with stuff that works um, first and then we can try to figure out how to make it smarter. Yeah, I would argue yeah. something as uh, simple and works is brilliant. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, with that copy paste augmentation, because we actually use that quite a bit as well in our work, uh, to our surprise as well, <laughs> it does work so well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that helps at all with the classification problem or distribution detection problem or both for this case? Uh, yeah, it helps with both. Um, so specifically, uh, we have a paper, I can't remember, maybe last, early last year, um, that was looking at synthetic data uh, for rare, to improve performance on rare species. And we did this copy-paste augmentation as a baseline and we're like sort of annoyed that it did almost as well as our like very complicated, you know, yep. <laughs> it just generated synthetic data. Um, and so, yeah, specifically it helped um, improve classification of the rare species in question in that paper, um, you know, without hurting comments on other species, which was the goal. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't tried it yet for like a fine grain classification problem, but we frequently are to the issue where we have like some weird object we're trying to detect and we only have like maybe 15, 20, 30 examples of it. Uh, and literally we, like, we do what you said, we it out. We just rotate it and change the color jitter and we paste it on like a hundred other types of background images and train a very high quality detector, uh, not like a fine grain classification model or anything. Cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. At this point, especially with stuff like wildlife insights where I have access to like so much data, I mean, I just use like really stupid distillation all the time, right? Like just take a model that works reasonably well and apply it to all your data and train on that. And generally it seems to improve results, right? I mean, it's, it's giving you more data diversity, maybe at the expense of like label accuracy, but yeah. So, so I got a, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Oriel, hi. I really enjoyed hi. your talk. Um, so I, I got a question about your uh, validation versus uh, train sets. So um, you, you, what I see that you did is you, you tried to, um, to separate them each time by the logic, like a location logic or camera logic. And have you tried to mix this kind of thoughts, like in, to, to mix the, maybe do something like a course validation each time using a different method? Um. Yeah, I, that's actually a really good idea. I haven't, I mean, I have looked at cross validation across um, like held out location um, mm -hmm. sampling and uh, basically just as a sanity check to make sure that there, you know, that drop off in performance wasn't just because of some you know, specificities of the locations we've subset. Um, but we do find is that there are some locations that are just harder than others. And usually it's easy either because the camera is at sort of a a non-normal uh, perspective, like they put it higher up looking down or it's lower to the ground, or um, there's some massive shift in the species priors for that camera. So for example, there we have one camera that in Caltech camera traps that has a bobcat that lives near it. And like 90% of the images of that camera are bobcats. But in terms of like the overall distribution of the data set, bobcats are, bobcats are quite rare. And so stuff mm -hmm. like that um, can cause like pretty significant effects, but sort of overall, um, the cross validation in terms of like holding out different sets of locations doesn't seem to really um, affect like the average validation performance too much. Um, 
And I think sort of maybe interestingly there, so say you use cross-validation um, using one of these dimensions. So generally with cross-validation, right, you have this IID assumption and then you, you cross-validate and you pick sort of your best model in some way, right? So, yeah. you know, okay, so you have some model that seems to perform well for some set of this cross-validation. Is that model better? You know, like it, it's kind of like a, I feel like uh, with cross-validation, there is kind of this interesting thing where sure you can do cross-validation and you can evaluate over like, you know, some subset uh, or, you know, do some aggregate, you know, cross-validation metric results. But then like, what do you, what do you do? Like what, what model do you give to your end user? Yeah, so, so perhaps um, you, you're talking about post-validation, like a full cost validation of the whole data set, but I'm, I'm sure. looking at- Sure, maybe I didn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but but I'm looking at like the images per category and uh, per location, which are differently separated than the 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 images that are actually um, picked. Like the validation is picked over his specific locations, and I'm I'm is there a difference between these two validation sets? Like they give a totally different. Um, um, is that, what's the distance between each of these uh, accuracy levels, say, uh, to the in comparison to the training set in one option of validation and in the other one? Because like in each kind of uh, validation, you learn something, right? Yeah, and it might true. be something different. It might be something different. Yeah, and actually there's, there's kind of this interesting question there um, and something that we've been exploring a bit and, and talking to some other researchers a bit, which is like, how, how do you do the right kind of ensemble? So like, yeah. say you like, honestly, it's fine to overfit on a location if you're going to need a model that works well on that location, right? Like it's probably like, why not let a model overfit if that's your goal? That And so what's the right trade off in terms of like, you know, maybe taking an ensemble or letting like having these aggregates of models where some of them really are sensor specific and some of them are region specific and some of them are habitat type specific and some of them are nighttime versus daytime specific and like can you can you learn the right way to to let these things focus on different dimensions of the problem and potentially aggregate them in, in some reasonable way i think that's really interesting and it's like a, like something i'm actively investigating with some students right now um uh in terms of just like high level like uh so um we did look at you know say you have a static network of camera traps and you want a model that works well for those static camera traps and you don't care about generalizing to anything else so then probably the right but you want it to work over time then the right way to think about your data split is like okay well let's hold out like we were talking about before hold out an entire season of data and investigate how well you generalize over time and what we have found is that you do get degradation over time, even in the same static cameras, because think there are slight shifts, right? You get like model drift in some way, but it's, it's really just the real world is drifting and your model stays the same. Um, that that gap in performance is a lot less than if you're acting asking the model to work on new locations. Um, and like the daytime, the day night models, like in practice, we haven't seen better results training separate day night models than we have just training them together. So we usually train them together, but we have probed it. Um, but yeah, I haven't so, ever done this like systematically over the whole, like all of these different dimensions and tried to, it's, it's probably a good idea. So, so a question from uh, another period in my work is like, uh, when you take the IR pictures, uh, do you take them 24, 24 seven or only during the night? Uh, we only take IR pictures at night that they use IR flash um, during the day those pictures are just entirely blown out um, but I, maybe a, a different sensitivity to the IR would bring you uh, pictures that look exactly the same as the night pictures yeah it's possible um, I don't have access to hardware that like mm -hmm. the, the off-the-shelf camera traps don't support that but it yeah I think that that's definitely like if you you could uh, yeah hardware you could absolutely tune that type of thing it'd be really interesting well you could you could do something very simple as like put, putting a diffuser over the il flesh hmm. mm -hmm. 
So you lose yeah. like a, a, a timer with a diffuser. Would lo- you would lose this uh, IR effect during the day. You, w- you would get the IR from the sun, but get the same kind of picture. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. That would be interesting to look at. I think like, yeah, I have a lot of questions in my mind about like, you know, whether these off the shelf camera traps are really the, the right thing to use generally. Um, but if you use a you- different, if you use a different camera, right? If you change the cameras, you change your whole data set. You start from scratch. It's kind of problematic to change the camera. Yeah. And uh, one thing that definitively, like that you have to be a little careful about is like, um, yeah, just generalization in terms of camera hardware is also a thing. Um, and uh, the really dumb version of that is a lot of these cameras will put logos or like watermarks on the images yeah. that are collected and it's massively easy to overfit to those so like <laughs> cropping out the logo is like a thing right it's not really a problem if all your cameras are the same but as yeah. soon as you start to have multiple types of camera then you'll your model will learn like oh the bushnell logo it means it's a pangolin or whatever yeah yeah these are really good ideas though and i think there's a lot of people who are super interested in um you know making sort of updated camera traps. I mean, one thing that's definitively true is a lot of the off the shelf cameras are really designed for hunting to some extent. It's like they're designed for mid scale terrestrial mammals. And so like, what if you're island conservation and you're you're interested in uh, detecting invasive rodents, right? Because they wipe, they devastate bird populations really quickly on islands. You want edge based systems that will do real time detection of any rodent species on an island. The rodents are really small. Um, the IR sensors really not optimized for that. Like, yeah. So like, w- what are, like, what are the ways that you could build camera traps that could be a little bit more focused maybe, or like more optimal for detecting certain things. And I'm actually really interested in multimodality. Um, you know, yeah. like for some species, it's like the, au- like, why are you using vision? You should use audio for a lot of birds. Like audio is a much stronger species signal, you know, than like trying to visually discriminate between 10 species of little brown bird in a given region. Yeah, um, so absolutely. like a combination of audio and visual and, and I mean, currently I'm working on a project at Google where we're trying to do a uh, tree species identification um, over like, you know, very long time horizons, but how do you use satellite plus in situ data plus community science data plus, 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 <laughs> get better identification of tree species. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just the, the alignment of all the data is gonna be Yep. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I actually so, I have to head to a meeting, so I should oh. probably go. But <laughs> it's been really awesome to talk to all of you, and I'm super happy to answer questions um, offline afterwards as well. Um, here's my email. Um, yeah. Send that email. In the workout. there was a question in the YouTube chat. I just I'll send the email there. Oh, yeah. so that oh, actually, go ahead. Let's just um yeah. If it if it'll take a minute, I can try. I don't know. We'll we'll see. <laughs> so Pranav is saying I'm just thinking out loud. Rather than going for a particular validation set strategy, what if we train the models on a small data set and then keep adding data to increase accuracy on particular labels? Something like boosting algorithm where misclassified labels are more focused on. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of getting a little bit more into active learning. And this is absolutely the approach that we use in practice a lot of times, right? You'll take, so for example, with my camera traps in Africa, um, they're in Kenya. Uh, There's a lot of public training data in Tanzania um, from the Serengeti National Park. Uh, That camera trap data covers similar species and similar-ish regions of the world, like similar ecosystems, but it's not identical species. There are some species that don't exist in Lycopia that exists in Serengeti National Park. And there are some species that uh, do. And so this kind of like bootstrapped approach of like, how do you maybe just like run your model with the given set of species and try to figure out how to handle like, okay, well, generally say, you know, in the Serengeti, you have the Maasai giraffe and in Lycopia, you have a reticulated giraffe. There's no overlap actually. So if our model just predicts giraffe, it's probably now it's a reticulated giraffe, right? Like that's kind of a no brainer, but what about Kudu versus Elon, right? They look similar enough that there's confusion. And we had 
only Elons in the Mara or in Serengeti National Park, and now we have Kudu and Elon. So how do you add a new fine-grained class when your model probably confidently predict it as the thing that it was similar to? Um, and this like real world practical way of like trying to add new species iteratively and when you can or cannot trust the confidence of a machine learning model um, in terms of like the signal it's going to give you, um, I think is really interesting. Um, but there's a, one of my friends, um, Benjamin Kellenberger has this tool called Abe, which is like a just, I mean, there's other tools like this out there, but it's kind of like a iterative active learning approach for biodiversity. Um, so, you know, you label some data, you, you give it an initial model, and then it'll sort of target specific labels based on basic active learning stuff. And, uh, and then you can try to work through it iteratively that way. And it's, it's pretty accessible. So it's something that I send to a lot of ecologists who are interested in adapting a model to your region. Yes, and it, 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 and it, it, it. for adding fine grain results, you have the hierarchical categorization that someone in one of the past meetings showed on uh, uh, ImageNet 21K, that you do hierarchical labeling, that you have, this is a giraffe, and this is a certain type of giraffe. You could do that and add the fine grain. So you're talking about maybe like a hierarchical approach um, in a taxonomic way? Uh, yeah, I think that that's something that people have absolutely looked into and I've actually seen papers that have like, that are published that have exactly contradictory results. Some say that, you know, that sort of building in this taxonomic hierarchy is super useful and some find that it does nothing or it actually hurts. Um, and I think it really depends on which set of the, ta of the taxonomy you're looking at, like what your class set is, because there are some taxonomic groups that are uh, have a lot of like intra-class variants and some that have a lot of inter-class variants. And so what you run into is like, you know, sometimes you have very visually similar species that are in completely separate groups of the taxonomic tree because they've learned genetic or visual mimicry to try to like trick each other or trick other, you know, um, animals in the area. And then sometimes you have stuff where it's like, oh, everything that is a giraffe really looks like a giraffe, right? There's not, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, well, that giraffe has, you know, slithers on the ground. Like they're all like really tall and have spots of some sort or another. And um, so I think it can be really helpful. And then in other cases, it can actually hurt. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we got to wrap up. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for this very engaging talk. Um, I love the interaction also with the audience. Tim has raising his hand. Is it by mistake or is it on purpose? Oh, no, I wanted to to thank you for your great it, presentation. It is applause. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for sure. For sure. A good way to mark applause, by the way. Um, I want to <laughs> add to everybody here, you guys are working on really cool stuff and you shared some in the chat here. Um, we're a small group right now, but in the community, many people are interested in these things. So feel free to post on Reddit everything you're doing. This will go also on the newsletter. So people will see what you've written um, and maybe, you know, something can come out, come out of it. So whenever you want, just post it there and I'll add it to the, uh, to the newsletter. And really thank you for this. I, as a spectator from the side, mostly this time, enjoyed it a lot. Um, thanks everybody. And until next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you.